Thank you for this event once again. This is an opportunity for us to explain to your people about the topic, the mystery of the new heaven and the new earth. Lord, help us to understand this mystery. Holy Spirit, guide us, teach us your word, make known to us the interpretation thereof. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, today we are going to be explaining the mystery of the new heaven and the new earth. We are going to be exploiting the book of Revelation because when we talk about the new heaven and the new earth, what happened to the old heaven and the old earth? The Bible told us that the old heaven and the old earth will pass away. Like a garment, they shall be changed. But a new heaven and a new earth will set in. And this new heaven will give us insights into what the new heaven will look like as a bride being adorned for her husband. And the book of Revelation specified it to us in that format. But what happened to this old world? This old world will melt away with father heat. The Bible says the element shall be dissolved. Why do we believe or take this seriously as believers? Because when Jesus was at the temple, the disciple came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 to explain to him the building of the temple and the manner of stone that were put together in building the temple and the span of life the temple has lived. Jesus made known to them that there will not be left one stone upon an other that will not be thrown down when this event will happen. So the disciples were curious, not knowing how possible that would be. Something as big as the temple being thrown down without no trace of one stone or another. They came to Jesus hoping for an interpretation of when would, which kind of battle, which kind of war-shaking event will lead to this. Jesus exposed them to his second coming. That all this event will happen. But before it happened, there will be a lot of deception going on. And they should be weary. Lest no one deceive them. Because this day will not come to pass until some people are being deceived. Being deceived to do the wrong thing. Being deceived to carry out the doctrines that were not originally from God. God expects us as believers to watch so that we do not allow our house to be broken into. Because if the good household owner has known what part of the night the thief was coming, I tell you of the truth, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken into. But I say again unto you this time, watch. Because on such an hour and time you know not, your lot doth come. And that is the reason why believer must watch. And that's why Christ gives us the Lord's Prayer. When the disciple came to him and said, teach us to pray, even as John teaches his disciple, Jesus said to them, when you pray, say in this format, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For God will to be done on earth as it is being done in heaven. That means there has to be a shift of power. You and I know that the government of this world does not do God's will. Neither is God's will be done on earth today. We don't need a scientific mind to tell us that. We knew fully well that men want their will to be done. We have autocrat leaders who want the people to even worship them rather than God. So God's will is not being done. So that's why he said when we pray, we should say it in that format, that God's will should be done on earth. What happened when God's will is being done? We understand it from Genesis in the book, in the Garden of Eden. 
Man and beast lived peacefully because God's will was being done. We understand that there were fruits that bring all manner of fruits every year. There were gold at the bank of the river. There were diamonds, all precious stones at the bank of the river. We can get whatsoever things we wanted only by just receiving it directly from the garden. Man was heart was not yet corrupted with sin and vanity, and his mind has not been pushed towards labor. When God's will is done, we have fellowship with God every evening, just like Adam has in the garden. When God's will is done, we have ability to reach out to souls that are lost, and all souls are saved, and no one is lost. There is no more pain, there is no more death, there is no sickness, there is no affliction, but a perfect world. What you and I will call utopia, where everything is at peace. That is what happened if God's will is done. Because he knew the thought he has towards us. Even right from the day that man fell in the garden, when we ate the forbidden fruits, the Lord said he knows the thought he has concerning us. And that thought is the thought of good, not of evil. To give us a hope and a future. It doesn't matter what we go through today. It doesn't matter the pain we suffer. The affliction we go through. The evil pains that have been open for us on a daily basis. But we know of one truth. That the thoughts the Lord has towards us are thoughts of good. They are not an evil thought. They are not thought of wickedness. But they are thought of peace. They are thought of joy. They are thoughts to give us a hope and a future. And we know that his will above all things is that we should prosper and be in good health. Even as our soul prosper in the Lord, that is God's will. It doesn't matter what the earth says. It doesn't matter what our situation may speak differently. But that is God's thoughts concerning us. That is his plan. That is his purpose. And that is the reason why he has promised us a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus went away from the disciple. And he said, I go to my father, because in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I will come back again and receive you to myself, so that where I am, there will my servants be also. The Lord has gone 2,000 years ago to prepare you a place in heaven, so that when he has finished, Preparing such a beautiful place for you, where he is, there will his servants be also. The Lord is coming back, and when he returns, he is coming with joy, he is coming with boldness, he is coming with glory, he is coming with honor, he is coming with power and great glory. And when he has finished preparing the place, and I tell you, he will receive you to himself. Where he is, there will you be also. God is coming. He's coming to receive you to himself. He had, when he has finished preparing the place shortly, he will return. He has traveled for about 2,000 years. We don't know what time he will return. He can return today. He can return tomorrow. He can return next month. But today, we should be happy. A lot of Christians don't seem very happy for their Lord to return. Maybe because they have lived a life contrary. Because if the good house owner has known what part of the night the thief would come, he would have watched. He would not have suffered his house to be broken into. But I tell you, watch. Because on that time, at that minute, you know not your Lord doth come. We do not know when he will return. That's why if you are a good servant, your master left you in charge of his goods to give your fellow servant their food in due season. The Bible says, blessed is that servant. When his master returns, he shall find so doing. But if that wicked servant says in his heart, my master has delayed his arrival, he begins to beat his fellow servant. He begins to eat and drink. And with the hypocrite, the Lord said, the Lord of that servant will come. At a time, he never looked for him. And at an hour, he never expected him to come. As a date, he never predicted and he will beat him and put him with the hypocrites. Brethren, I beseech thee, watch. 
And again, I say to you, watch. These books were not written to provoke you to anger. These books were not written to condemn you because your sins are so much. These books were written for our instruction, for inspiration, for doctrine, for learning, so that the man of God will be equipped in any good work. And these books also was written first to remind us to watch, to remind us to pray, to remind us to ask for that day to come, so that man can return back to the garden, so that man can return back to the beginning, where all things were at peace. If you are a wise believer, this is prayer that should come from your mind every day of your life. Pray that his kingdom should come. Because if God's kingdom come, God does not permit injustice in his kingdom. The Lord your God is a jealous God. And because God is jealous of you, he will not allow any evil come close to you. That's why you should pray that his kingdom should come. Today we are going to be studying that kingdom, bringing the kingdom to the earth. The Lord has shown us and promised us that he will set up his kingdom. That the government of this world will pass away. And so will all their authority. So will all their powers pass away. But there will be a new world and a new heaven. The old earth will pass away. And the old things will pass away. And behold, there will, all things will be new. And he that made these things said, I have made all things new. And that is the teaching that we have today. Brethren, God bless you as you participate. The Lord will make everything new in your life today. The book of Revelation concludes with a final vision to manage of the management of heaven and earth where an angel showed John one of the disciples of Jesus Christ is turning bright that will symbolize the new creation of the new Jerusalem that was coming from heaven as a bride that was adorned for her husband. We knew how bride looked on her wedding days. A garnish with white clothes, beautiful and shining. That is exactly how this new Jerusalem looked. When God bring it down from heaven, and the Bible says, God and his covenant with the people of Israel, he has promised to fulfill it. Because he said to the children of Israel, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And because of that, he would not break his covenant that he made with Abraham their father. Because he promised Abraham that their father, that he the Lord, their God, he is able to keep his promise. And he make it clear that because when he make a covenant with Abraham, because God is immutable, he passed through. He made Abraham fall into a deep sleep. He passed through the cycle alone. Meaning, this covenant with Abraham has no precondition. It doesn't matter whether they have sinned or not. But that covenant must stand. And God announced that this comes to live with humanity forever and he is going to make all things new and that means god is not going to be in heaven creating the new heaven and the new earth god is going to be living with us and that's the meaning of the word emmanuel god living with man god will live with us here on earth we don't have to go to heaven to see him but because he will be resident here on earth and he will be the world king that will rule over the city of Jacob forever and ever. And the Bible says his kingdom, there is no end. That means you cannot fire him, you cannot impeach him, and you cannot vote him out, and he's not going to resign. He is not a democratic governor. So, you better be ready to live under his leadership. Is the new Jerusalem the same as the new heaven and the new earth? The New Jerusalem of Revelation chapter 21 is about 2,225 square kilometer in length, which with breadth and height, a city of this gigantic population 
cannot be located on earth. But as stated in Revelation chapter 21, a new heaven and a new earth, and the city comes down out of heaven from God, presumably, presumably unto the new earth, which we know that each of this city was clear just as it was in the beginning in Eden. When God created the heaven and the earth in the beginning, he planted a garden in, the, in, in Eden where he put man until the earth grew. The same thing will happen in the end. When God is about to make the new heaven and the new earth, he would establish the new Jerusalem from heaven. And where there will be no stain. The Bible says nothing unclean, no dog. Nothing that is unclean is permitted to enter. And this new Jerusalem will be stated in the geographical location where we have today Jerusalem in Israel. And that will be the same location of this new Jerusalem. And this new Jerusalem will be planted until the new heaven and the new earth take root. So that is exactly the purpose. And that's what we understand from the book of Revelation. So in Eden, the format of God has not changed throughout history. In Genesis, when he created the heaven and the earth, the Bible says he has not caused grass and things to grow on the earth yet. But he sent a mist to water the surface of the earth. But first and foremost, because man was already created, man cannot survive without food, waters, and those things. God planted a garden in Eden for man's comfort. The same thing in this new Jerusalem. God understood that creating a new heaven and a new earth would take some capital and time. So he made first and foremost this new Jerusalem for the rapture sent to live in before there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Because the Bible says the tabernacle of God will dwell with man. The tabernacle of God we dwell with man because he will be their God. This time is not going to wipe out the entire world, but he's going to take from the world into this new world. And that is the new world we're talking about. And this new heaven, which will be clarified in this teaching. In Genesis chapter 22, from verse 3, it said, and there shall be no more curse. What happened to the curse in Genesis? Remember God caused the serpent to lose his hand and feet, to crawl on their belly and to eat dust for the rest of their life. But this time the curse is gone. And remember God caused a woman to pain in labor when she brings forth a child. And this time that pain is gone. There is no more cause. Remember, God caused the man to labor. But this time, that cause is wiped away. There is no more cause. Remember, man was caused to return to dust, for out of it he was taken. But this time, man shall no more die. The cause has been lifted. So there is a healing process that takes place in this new Jerusalem, or new heaven, whatever you call it. It's this healing process means the power of death has lost its glory. That's why the Bible tells us, There shall the same come to pass. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Because the strength of the grave is in the law, and the strength of the law is sin. But now that sin has been defeated, the devil who corrupts the world has been thrown into the lake of fire and him and his angel therefore no more sin. So because there is no more sin in the world, therefore death has been what? Defeated. The power of law has come to an end. We just like the beginning when man has not eaten the fruit of knowledge to know what is evil and good. But this time we are just like as we were in the prey creation. When we were the sons of Jehovah, the son of the Almighty God, 
That is exactly what God will return us to. That's why believers should always pray that God's kingdom should come. Because if his kingdom come, that will be the end of suffering for mankind. And these teachings clarifically make known to us that in verse 4, that and they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their forehead. Remember, when Moses wanted to see the face of the Lord on Mount Horeb, the Lord said to Moses, No man see my face and live. No man see my face and live. I will pass back and I will remove my hand, you might see my back. Because if you see my face, you shall not live. But this time, man must have transcended that righteousness with the righteousness of the blood of the Lamb to be able to see the face of God face to face. And beyond that, the mark of Christ will be upon our forehead. We are his. We are no longer of the world, but we have been taken out of the world. We are now the children of God. God will protect us by himself. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. We know in that city, you don't need to pray for light, candlestick, kerosene, invent generator, or transformer, or look for solar power plant, because the Lord is your light. So the light of God will be so bright that you don't need additional light. That means the prayer is a place of a permanent glory, permanent day, permanent joy, permanent peace. The joy of the Lord will lighten every darkness. That is exactly the city we are talking about here. There is something more peculiar about this city. In verse 6, he said unto me, This saying are faithful and true. This saying are faithful and true. The Lord God of the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto thee, to show unto his servant the things which must shortly be done. This statement stated here are trusted. They are faithful, that means they can be trusted, and they are true. Because God sent his servant, the prophet, to write this thing into sign. Into sign. Write something into sign. Because for you to be able to write things into sign, it has to be a visual representation of the things you are writing into sign. That is what God is telling you today. That these things are things that we eyewitness account of the vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which God gave to me. To who? To Jesus Christ. And to write it into sign to his servant, John. And that is why John tells you that these things are what I see with my eyes. And things that I can attest to. And things that are faithful and true. That the Lord, the Lord God of the holy prophets, Send his angel before send his angel to do what to show unto his servant these things which must shortly come to pass. That means it's not an eternal vision, it's not a perpetual desolation. I know many of you will say, Since our father died, heaven and earth has continued the way they are, and so they will remain forever and ever. <laughs> The Bible says to us, it's only a fool that says there is no God. Only a fool. The Bible says, this the fool says in his heart, since our father dies, 
everything has continued the way they are. When we did, when is the promise of his coming? When will it happen? The Bible says, the coming of the Lord shall be like a thief in the night. Because if the good house owner has known in what hour of the night the thief will come, he would have guided his door. In fact, he would have hired extra security force. He would have put door alarm on the camera. Not forget to use burglary proof. So that when the thief comes, he will not cut him off guard. But I tell you, watch. If you don't know the day that the thief will come, what do you do? You secure your house every day. So if you don't know what time your Lord will come, secure your holiness and your salvation jealously every single day. So for you, who once saved but forever saved, protect your salvation. Guard it jealously. Don't, you don't know when the thief will come. Because it can come at the middle of the night. It can come when you just left the home and you said, today look like a free day. Let me just go and visit my friend. Leave the door open. That may be the day the thief is coming. Brethren, you have to watch. Because the good house owner, if you watch, he will not be caught off guard. So you as a believer must watch so that you don't fly to heaven naked without your garments. Watch so that you always have your garment on. When the Lord returns, he will not cast you, not be prepared. And I tell you, it will be too late to say, Lord, wait for me. I just need 20 seconds to prepare. The Bible says in a twinkle of an eye, it's less than a microsecond. So you don't have time. If you don't prepare, you will walk with him naked. Brethren, that is why we must watch. In verse 1, he makes us understand, in this new heaven, this new Jerusalem, we have what? The pure rivers of life, which is as clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of what? The Lamb. There are two thrones set here, throne of God and the second one is the throne of the Lamb. And the street thereof, the street of it, on either side of the rivers, where the trees of life, which bear twelve manner of fruit, and ye have fruit every single month. If the trees yield its fruits every single month, that means God is telling you that the fruits from the tree of life can be plucked every time you need fruit. You will not have access. Remember in the Garden of Eden, what happened to the tree of life? The access was blocked by the cherubim soul that turned it on every side to keep man away from destruction so that they will not eat the fruit of life and live forever in sin and torment and end up like the devil. But God prevent, deliberately prevented man so that man can return to dust because man was a dua babe. The devil deceived the flesh, but the spiritual man is holy. And God wanted that spiritual man to take up a new flesh and return to God in holiness and purity. And that was why God prevent, deliberately prevented man access to the tree of life in the garden. So that man would not eat the fruits of life and live forever in sin and rebellion like the devil does. So man's salvation was planned from the beginning. That's why God said he's killed a lamb that has not committed sin. Innocent blood was used to clot man from the rot of the seed of the serpent. The rot of the seed of the serpent. So we have to see here that at a contention in the world, the seed of God, the seed of God or the seed of man or the seed of the woman, which literally means every human race, 
and the seed of the serpent, which means the children of the evil one. Those are the two seeds that are in conflict. But when man fell, man, God discovered that nakedness abound in man. And the rot of the seed of the woman cannot be prevented. Because man was naked because of sin. Remember the Bible said the righteous is as bold as a lion. But the wicked flew while no man pursued him. That means the confidence of man to stand before the lion. The confidence of man to stand before the devil has been taken away by sin, just as it happened to us today. The soul that sinned shall die. There is no two ways about it. Not even God can stop that. The soul that sinned shall die. So God has to bring the seed forth. That was not of the seed of a woman, but made in the fashion of a man. An innocent lamb who has not committed any sin after the sins of Adam to pay the ultimate sacrifice for man. And his skin was used to clothe man from the nakedness. So that's why today, when we talk about salvation and righteousness, we don't talk about our self-righteousness because from the foundation of the fall of man, all our thought of righteousness is as fading rank before God. We, have, we cannot be holy. It doesn't matter what kind of life we live. We can live a consecrated life, a perfect life, but all our righteousness is as fading rank. But we cannot be clothed by our own righteousness. That's what God is telling us. Because we tried it in the garden. We cover ourselves with apron. Hoping that we can be covered for our nakedness. But God made known to us that the apron or the covering of religion cannot save us. But by the shed of an innocent blood shall we be covered. That's why his God became a man in the person of Christ Jesus, being made and fashioned as a man. He humbled himself and he became obedient, willingly obedient, even to the point of death, even to the point of a shameful death on the cross, that he may redeem us to God. And that was the thoughts God had concerning us, the thought of peace. That's what the Bible told us in John 3, verse 16. That for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever accepts his salvation will not perish, but what we gain everlasting life. Because God did not send his Son into the world for the purpose to execute judgment. No, his purpose was not to condemn the world. But that we through him might be saved. The purpose of all this teaching, the purpose of all the rocks, is to save man, to bring man back to the garden. Because sin must be judged. And that's why God told Moses when the children of Israel rebelled in the wilderness to make a brazen serpent, to hang it upon the tree, that whoever look upon it, will not be ashamed. And that's why the Bible will not have understood what it means, except for the writer of Hebrew, who made known to us that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Even so shall Jesus himself be lifted up. The word Son of Man, what does this symbolize? What does this stand for? And why was it given in the scripture? Why not the Son of God? Why be called the Son of Man? Second Adam. Adam was the first man. Jesus was the second Adam. 
the first Adam was made after the flesh, but the second Adam was made a quickening spirit. And this quickening spirit came that he might purify the sons of Levi until they bring forth an excellent sacrifice to God. He was made as a priest after the order, not after the order of Aaron, which priest was priesthood was not allowed to be continued because of death. But after the order of Melchizedek, the Bible said if he was on earth, he should not have been a priest. Because there were priests already on earth who offer sacrifice according to the law. But this man with one sacrifice he has perfected forever. He did not need to cross every human being every day. He crossed the foundation of sin. Because of one man's sin, all men that were born became sinners. Just by one man's righteousness, we all who have sinned shall be declared righteous. So Christ gave us life. While in Adam we have death. And death reigned from the beginning, even through Abraham, through Moses. But ever since Christ, the kingdom of heaven is preached. The return of man back to the garden. God has promised us that new hope, the new hope to his garden. The same garden where man was driven from in Genesis. God has made an ultimate plan to bring us back into that garden, but not as a sinful entity to be pitied, not as a prey to the seed of the, of the serpent, but as a quickening spirit, as a joint heir with Christ. And the only way to do that is to graft us into himself. And that is the marriage feast of the Lamb. Because marriage is the union we are to become one. And we who were alien from the covenants, that's what the Bible said unto us, now in time past we are not God people, but now you are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a peculiar charge of God, who should show forth the praise of God, who has called you out of darkness, into his marvelous life, which in time past you were not a people, in time past you were not God people, but now you are God people. In time past you did not have access to God's mercy because you were a condemned criminal, meaner, at the mercies of the seed of the serpent. But now you are God people who have obtained mercy, who should show forth the praise of God, who has called you out of this life of darkness into his marvelous light. That means we have access as children of the light, direct access to the Father. Let's read what this access gives us. In verse 3, he makes us understand the access take away causes. That means we have no more cause. The cause that we have in the beginning was man. No wonder the children of Israel said to Jesus, you said, you shall be free. We are the student of Abraham. We have never been in bondage. How therefore you say we shall be free? Jesus made known to them, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. But a slave cannot abide in the house forever. But a son does. A slave does not have access. But a son has access. Therefore, if the son of man shall make you free, you will be free indeed. If Jesus declare you free from sickness, you will be free indeed. If he declare you free from the power of death, you will be free indeed. If he declare you free from poverty, you will be free indeed. If he declare you free from trouble, you will be free indeed. If he declare you free from cases, you will be free indeed. But if he does not declare you free, no other name under heaven, given among men by which we can be saved. It doesn't matter what that name is. 
It doesn't matter the vulnerability or the power that the name commands, but there is no name under heaven other than the name of Jesus that can set any man living or dead free. That is what it tells you. And that is the truth. And it has been proven. Why? All this logic. Because the serpent celebrated when man fell. He's, he wanted man to be under his permanent control. The grief of evil. Where he would reign over the seed of a woman forever. But God said no. That would not be possible. The first step of God was to drive them out of the garden. Man thought it was wickedness, but God saw it as a thought. The thought of good. That's why sometimes you see some harsh things happen in your life. God deliberately allows it and you say, why would God allow me to suffer this long? Just like he dealt with the children of Israel in Egypt. He allowed them to be tormented as a slave for 450 years. And the people say, even to the extent Pharaoh begin to kill, they have any all their main children. But <laughs> God thought concerning them was to separate them from the Egyptian. Why? Wow. The Egyptians were idol worshippers. They did not count the slave worthy enough to worship their idol. Because if they have given them food and precaution to eat. They would have had no choice but to serve the same God of Egypt, therefore making them unrighteable for God. But God deliberately allowed them to be tormented in Egypt, just as God allowed you and I to live in the world, but not to be part of the world system. So therefore, the world cannot love us because we are not of His, and we cannot be part of the world. Though we live in the world, though we breathe in the world, though we walk around in the world, but we are not of this world. The world cannot love us because we are not of it. The world we love is own. And that was exactly the reason why God allowed some certain things to happen so that his name and his name alone can be glorified. Just as we see in the book of Matthew when they brought a man who was paralytic before Jesus and asked Jesus, what sin has this man committed? A man who was born blind, he is now 40 something years old. What sin did this man commit that since the day he was born until now he's 40 something? He has not seen light. What sin did he commit or any of his parents? I know many of us today still ask that question. If you say there is God, how come this man is suffering? Even when he's going to church, he serve God every day. God said, This man has not committed sin, neither any of his parents. But this thing happens so that the name of God can be glorified. God kept somebody for 40 something years without ability to see the son. For what? So that he can glorify his name. And God is still able to glorify his name in your life today. He's able to glorify your, his name in that situation. The reason why since you get married now, you have no issue, is that God wants to glorify his name. Elkanah has three sons before Samuel was born. What are the names? Who remember? Their name was not recorded. But one that came as a result of promise, whose name was Samuel, because the mother asked him of the Lord. His name is remembered even to today, not only in Israel, but around the world, whose name was Samuel. And he was a prophet, a great prophet, throughout the scripture. The reason is because he was asked of God. No disappointment in God's calendar. It doesn't exist. Delays in God Canada is not a symbol of defeat or denial. It's a symbol of greater glory and greater things to come. The throne of God and of the Lamb were his servants and they shall serve him. The throne of God. God removed his throne from the midst of angels. 
who do his bidding, who worship him. Uncountable times a day. He bring it to live with man. <laughs> the throne of God is with men. Oh God. And they shall see his face. Why is this important? Remember when in, in Horeb, when in Mount Sinai, when Moses wants to see God. And God said to Moses, when Moses said, God show me your glory. The Lord said to Moses, no man see my face and live. Now, we have access to his face. The veil that prevents us from accessing the face of God is torn. Now, because man sin has been taken out, now we can come face to face to the throne of grace. We can see his face. And the servant can see him face to face. And his name will be engraved on our forehead. That means we have the mark of redemption. We are his. And there shall be no more night there. What happened to night? Gone. Because remember the sun and the moon will pass away. And the stars will fall from heaven. And there shall they need no candle. You don't need light bulb. Neither light of the sun. For the Lamb, for the Lord God giveth them light. The Lord gives you light. We don't know. We know His presence alone is a light to illuminate. He is the Father of light. So if He Himself gives us light, we don't need sun. We don't need more. We don't need any of such things. And they shall reign forever and ever. His servant will reign. <laughs> not for one year. Not for a thousand years. But forever. And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true. The Lord God of the holy apostles of prophets send his angel to show unto his servant the things which must shortly be done. All these things are in preparation. That's why Christ has been away for such a long time, preparing all this event for us. So they will surely come to pass. So wait for it. Because if the good householder has no what time of the night the thief will come, he would have watched. And I say unto you, watch. And I, John, saw these things. In verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is the he that keepeth the saying of this prophecy of this book. Blessed are those who keep the word of the prophecy of this book. Why the time is at hand. Is the new Jerusalem the same as the new heaven and new earth? No, obviously not. The new Jerusalem is just in verse Revelation 21 is the square kilometer of about 225 kilometer in length, width, and height. A city of this gigantic proportion cannot be located on earth. But as stated in Revelation chapter 21, a new heaven and a new earth, the city comes down out of heaven from God, presumably unto the new earth. We we know each other in heaven. Just as in Genesis, there is no detail of the new heaven and the new earth. In Revelation, remember the Bible said in Genesis, God created the heaven and the earth, full stop. Then the earth was without form. So, in Revelation again, God put a gap. God created a new heaven and a new earth, full stop. 
What happened after that? The earth means time. God did not measure about creating trees. He did not measure about creating the road. But we know it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. We did not know the technological advancement. We did not know anything because he did not tell us. But God told us something about the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem is like the new Eden. Because most of the things, features explained in the new Jerusalem is the same as in the Garden of Eden, but only in a far better proportion. God made it clear to us, in this new Jerusalem, there is a tree of life, which we know also existed in the Garden of Eden. We knew also that there is a river of the living water, which was not in Eden. But we know in Eden have four rivers, the Pisgah, the Euphrates, and the Ethiopia River, which run, and the rivers of Avela, which run through all the plains of Avela. And we knew all these things in Genesis, but which provide source of gold. And the Bible told us that the gold diamonds of those land were gold. But we now understand in this new one, we don't need to dig out gold because the street is made of gold. And diamonds and precious stones are his covering. So we don't need precious stones because they are the covering of the street. So that is what we discover in this new Jerusalem. We knew that it was hidden but different. And something specific in Eden before man fell, there was no causes. In the New Jerusalem, no more cause. Cause has been taken away. Death, cause to death, or return to dust, has been wiped out. Cause for woman to bear her seed through labor and pain has been taken out. And there is no more death. Because the Bible says there is no marriage, no given in marriage. We are all like what? Angels. There is no more marriage, no given in marriage in the new cities. So it will say be different from Eden that God said it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make him a help, meet for him. And woman was created. But this time, woman fell. Now, in this new heaven, we are all children of God. We are all married to Christ. There is no more woman, or, there is no more unions of marriage or children be born in the new Jerusalem. But God shall be their light. It's a city of a perpetual rule of God people. So this is a new calendar in God's plans. And God made it clear to us, in this new city, the cause of a woman's pains in childbirth is taken away. The cause of a man to labor is taken away. The cause upon the serpent has been overridden because the serpent has been thrown into the lake of fire. And that means all causes are cancelled. There is no more causes in these new cities. Now we understand that we knew each other in heaven. We will know each other in heaven. In fact, the Bible indicates we knew each other more fully than we know. We now know them. Apostle Paul declared, Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, It is true that our appearance will change, because God will give us a new bodies. 
similar to Jesus' resurrection somebody. Who are the dogs in Revelation 22 verse 15? Before we get to Revelation 22, let's just check the dogs. But the Bible says, outside the cities, before the new heaven and the new earth, the old earth still exists when the new Jerusalem arrived. Outside the city, we have dogs. We have sorcerers. We have homogas. We have murderers. We have idolaters. Whosoever loveth and maketh a lie, they are being tormented forever. That is what happened outside the city. In verse 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Here again, there is a promise for the overcomer. Any man that is bold enough to overcome the world. In verse 8, but the fearful, the fearful, yes, the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, all liars, shall have their part in the lake that burned with fire brimstones, which is the second death. That is where the dogs are thrown in. The fearful. Those who are so much afraid, they cannot trust in God enough to stand for God because they are afraid of what society might say. People might laugh at me if I say I am a Christian. If I ever dare to stand for God, that my family will disregard me. My friends will hate me. People will no longer value me. So as a result, I am on my side. I cannot really stand for God. If I'm going to church, I'm going to cover my Bible. I'm going to hide away. I don't want people to know I am a Christian. My group will no longer accept me. If I believe, oh, I'm, my life is finished. I may lose my job in the office. The Lord says, you will be have your part in the lake of fire. Because if you deny the Lord before men, God will deny you before his father and before his holy angels and before all the congregation of the saints. But if you are bold enough to announce sin before men, he will announce you before his father, he will announce you before the saints, he will announce you before his holy angels. But brethren, the fearful are the first people to be thrown into the lake of fire. Those who cannot be bold enough to accept salvation. Those who have no confidence of faith. Because anybody that comes to God must believe that God is God. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. But if you are so full of fear, you fear the system, you fear the society, you will not stand for the truth. You lie because you are afraid. You are compromised because you are afraid. The system prevents you from saying the truth. You know the truth. The Bible says, He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him is a sin. You know what is good and you know how to do it. But you refuse to do it because of fear. Because you want to compromise. You don't want to offend some people. The Lord says, You will have your part in the lake of fire. Because you fear, the thing you fear most will come upon you. And the Lord said, in second people to be true, are the unbelieving. Show me before I believe. Oh, you say God exists. Can I see it? Can I touch it? Can I handle it? Those are the second group that will find themselves in the lake of fire. Even though you tell me about him, even though I am convinced, I will never believe until I handle him, until I am able to do this. Those that Jesus raised their children and the cross, they said to Jesus, come down from the cross and we will believe in you. Those are the people who are the unbelieving. They will be the second group in the lake of fire. And the second, the third groups are the abominable. Those who commit abominations with their bodies 
abomination with their leaves, abomination with their lifestyle. They are the third group in the lake of fire, and the fourth group are the murderers. Those who are murderers with their mouth, murderers with their hands, they are the third group, fourth groups in the lake of fire. And the last group, the fifth group, are the homogas and the sorcerers. Those who say, Thus save the Lord when God did not speak. And they are indulged in some occultic means to see into your pocket, to see into your finance, to see into your marriage, to see into your business, to see even things that they're supposed not to see. And they have not waited patiently for the Lord, who is able to see and reveal all things, but they have gone through some occultic means to see them. Those are the Gensea, those will be the sixth and seventh part in the lake of fire. And the next group is the idolaters, those who love this present world, who worship the flesh and worship the God of this world, their body. Those will be the eighth and above all, all liars. Those who cannot just stand for the truth. They will lie to defend themselves. They will lie for gain. They will lie for prosperity. They will lie for material benefit. They will also find their part in the lake of fire and shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This is the second death. My goodness. Verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vial, full of seven last prayer, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to the great and high mountain, and show me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending from God out of heaven. Having the glory of God and the light like unto stone precious, and even as jasper stone, clear as crystal. And I had a great and high wall, twelve gates, at the gate were twelve angels. And the names were written thereon, which of the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And on east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, on the west three gates. And the walls of the city was twelve foundations. On them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lord Jesus, of the Lamb, that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he spoke, he that spoke with me had a golden ring to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lie first square. The length is as large as the breadth. And the measure of the city with the ring and twelve thousand followers which is about 2,225 kilometers. And the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And the measure of the world thereof, and a thousand four hundred and four cubits, according to the measure of man, that is of the angel also. And the building of the wall and of it was of jasper. The city was pure gold, like unto a clear crystal. And the foundation of the walls of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stone. And the second foundation was jasper, the second saffron, the third Chalcedonian, and the fourth an emerald, and the fifth sadness, and the sixth sadios, and the seventh. Christianized, and the eighth barrier, and the ninth topaz, and the tenth Christos 
Pratos and the eleven Jacinth and the twelve Amethysts. And these twelve are the twelve colors of light. And these twelve gates were twelve pales. Every several gate was one pearl. And the streets of the city were of pure gold, and as it were transparent as glass. And I saw no temple therein, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. <laughs> God does not need a temple. He is our temple. And the city had no need of sun, neither of moon, to shine in it. The glory of God did lighted it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nation of them which are saved walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it. And the gate of it shall be not be shut by day, nor by night thereon. And there shall bring the glory and honor of the nation into it. And there shall be, there shall in no wise enter into that city anything that defileth, and whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb Book of Life. This is the final event of Revelation. Last week we look at the White Throne Judgment. Next week, we will take a close look at the book of Daniel, chapter. We are going to start our understanding prophecy from next week on the teaching on the book of Daniel. And we are going to start from Daniel chapter 1. God bless you as you participate. Let us pray. Father, we heard your word. The world written here are great. They are marvelous for your people. Lord, you said in your word, if any man shall add to the word of this prophecy, the Lord will add to his spread in the land. If any man shall remove from it, the Lord will remove his name from the book of life. Father, Lord, we beseech thee. Teach us thy word. Make known to us thy presence. Lord, we pray unto you. Come, Lord Jesus. Come and reign in our life. Come and reign in our family. Come and reign in our destiny. Come and reign in our marriage. Because you are our God. There is none like unto thee. Lord, teach us to know the truth. And the truth we know and believe will set us free. Lord, if once we look next week into the white throne judgment, help us to understand the mystery of the white throne judgment and the reason for it. That in everything, your name alone will be glorified. As many that are sick, let your healing be the apostle. As many that sit in darkness, let your light shine. As many that have not heard about this truth, that are still pondering in their heart right now, Say, I do not know if God has a son. I don't know who is he that comes from heaven. Oh, who is he that gather water in the hollows of his hands? Please, if God has a son, please tell me. What is his name? What is his son's name? I tell you, brethren, we pray to God Almighty that God should grant us the boldness to tell them, to make them know the name of God's son and to expand it to them in all truth and honesty. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, if you miss any part of this teaching, you can watch it on our website at cgfnslogin.app or on our Facebook at Groban, Groban Pastoral and Missionary Forum or CGF Open Heart Fellowship or Christian Global Foundation. You can watch this video and comment on it. Add it to your list so that you can watch us every Sunday by 5 p.m. God bless you as you participate in this.
Jesus' name. Amen.